Welcome back to the Sustainability Imperative, our three-day virtual festival. Thanks for joining us for the energy equation, which we're going to get into right now. I'm Steve Clemens, and I'm editor-at-large of The Hill. I'd like to thank our sponsor, the American Petroleum Institute, for their support of this track. Today, we'll be talking with state energy officials to get their blueprint on building sustainable energy systems statewide. It's a heavy lift. But before we get started, remember you can tweet us at, at the Hill Events using the hashtag, hashtag the Hill Sustainability. We're broadcasting live and we'll be taking your questions throughout the program. And if you experience any trouble with the live stream, please refresh the page. That should fix it. That's what they tell me anyway. Now I'm excited to welcome three state leaders who are really at the forefront of this for this discussion on how they're navigating the energy transition. Katie Dykes is Commissioner of Connecticut's Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, which recently announced its path to zero carbon carbon power by 2040. Senator Mark Pacheco is a state senator from Massachusetts, has a great Twitter feed I've been enjoying reading today, has recently been appointed chair of the Energy and Environment Committee of the Council of State Government's Eastern Regional Conference. And Kathleen Theoharidis, if I'm, Kathleen, did I, I, I want to just ask you, did I get that right, Theoharidis? Uh, it's Theoharides. Theo Herides, I want, yeah, that's, a, that's a great name. I want to make sure I had it right. Kathleen Theo Herides is Secretary <laughs> of the Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, which has announced its path to net zero through 2050 uh, through its D- 2050 decarbonization roadmap. Thank you all for joining me today. Listen, I think, you know, I'm, we've been talking to a lot of federal government officials, people in the private sector, advocates in the NGO community. Um, but I know that at the state level, when it comes to these kinds of questions, and I've been asking this, you know, throughout the last couple of days, you know, does gravity get us to net zero or are there hard choices and, and, and big lifts in the process? And so much of it's in the state level. I want to start with Mark and Mark say, you know, within with what you've been doing with Massachusetts and wind and a lot of fronts and you you've been basically very, very animated in your Twitter in this. What are the big uh uh, forks in the road that you think the state of Massachusetts has had to take, and what's replicable that you're doing that other states can do? I think you're muted, Mark. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, yeah, we could start off by working in a bipartisan way as we have been doing in Massachusetts. Uh, we're in a climate emergency. We need to uh, work with uh, very, very, very urgently to uh, to deal with this issue. When we look at uh, what we did, we actually codified in state statute back in 2008. Uh, uh, we we codified uh, emission uh, benchmarks uh, to get to 80 percent below by 2050. We looked at the new science. New science is telling us that's not nearly enough. We all need to do a much better job. So we began working together with the executive branch. We have a Republican governor, a Democratic legislature, and we've decided to put partisan politics aside and do what we should be doing for the citizens of Massachusetts and what everybody should be doing uh, for America and the world. And that's trying to save this planet, save humanity, and do what's right. And we can do it if we embrace the clean energy opportunities that are out there today. Um, More wind and solar and geothermal, energy efficiency. There are so many things that we can do. Uh, What we really need is the political will Mm. to get it done. Kathleen, you're, you're also in Massachusetts, so I'll keep Massachusetts and we'll jump over to Connecticut. Uh, but, you know, in, in terms of the role that you played and you've been you've been in the environment and, and climate area for a long time. What are some of the key programs that you're looking at? And when you know, I had Dan Jurgen uh, on yesterday, he said, you know, the Paris Climate Accord uh, renewables have been real game changers, but you still have a reality that oil and gas and coal, et cetera, for much of the world is still going to be upwards of 80 percent of energy for a long time. How do we, how do we um, make improvements across that swath from your perspective? Well, as our senator said, um, bipartisan or nonpartisan leadership on this issue is critical. And I think one of the roles that many of the states played over the last four years when climate was not such a focus at the federal level was ensuring that around the world, countries knew that United 
the states united together, we're still working to achieve uh, representative goals under the U.S. Paris Agreement. And so Connecticut and Commissioner Dykes is one of the states with us who has been part of the U.S. Climate Alliance, continuing to push the envelope on climate action um, across the country. And now with an administration that is so focused on solving climate change, we know that with state and federal and local leadership on this issue, we will be able to reach our 2050 net zero goal and to put in place policies that not only address climate change, but tackle um, environmental justice issues and make sure that we're doing this in a way that supports our economy. You know, a big piece of the transition for states in the Northeast and all along the Eastern seaboard is offshore wind. Hmm. Um, and that's exactly the kind of example where we're moving to a clean renewable resource. We're creating jobs, we're creating economic development. And the opportunity there is what I like to think about when I think about climate change. You know, a lot of it can be um, cast as a challenge and it is, but there is a real opportunity to recreate our energy system in a more equitable, inclusive and, and clean way. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Katie, I want to come over to you and jump in Connecticut. But, you know, you've, you let me just be honest. I've talked to everybody and it sort of seems everybody has a 2040 goal or a 2030 goal or a 2050 goal. And I'm just wondering, maybe we'll just get to those things and, you know, we'll have oil companies, we'll have, you know, renewables, we'll have states, uh, United Airlines. I was talking to Occidental Petroleum CEO yesterday and was very, you know, actually very impressed with their own commitment to net zero emissions by 2040. So in this, but I, I know those are just words, in, in terms of taking a state like Connecticut and moving forward, you know, what are the, the key steps you've got to put forward so that this is just not all talk? Well, you know, thanks for that. I think states have really been leaders in creating markets and creating opportunities for investment in clean energy and in, in this energy revolution. You know, we have been pioneering programs like our energy efficiency programs. Uh, we've reduced uh, energy demand by 18% since 2005 uh, through the investment in energy efficiency in our state, uh, driving forward with investments in, uh, in solar over the last uh, decade or so, we've seen those costs come down by 65% um, through running RFPs for solar projects. Um, offshore wind prices have come down 20% over the last three years in the RFPs we've been running for those mm. projects. So states have been creating markets, creating the pathway for investment. I'm so energized and excited about um, what we can do when we have federal partnership, um, infrastructure uh, dollars coming from Washington, uh, that can help drive the the further opportunities for investment um, and capital deployment around transmission uh, projects, around electric vehicle charging. Um, we are, you know, some of the most exciting conversations um, that we've been having over the last several months have been with forward-looking uh, companies um, like BP, like um, many of the uh, auto manufacturers that are getting into electric vehicles. Um, this doesn't have to be hard. We are working um, with those companies who are supporting initiatives like the Transportation Climate Initiative Program um, that mm. we're thrilled to be implementing uh, and, and moving forward jointly with, with Rhode Island and Massachusetts and Washington, D.C., because we want to create a clear investment pathway um, for you know, workers, for companies um, to be part of building wealth and building a, a thriving economy around decarbonizing um, our, our climate. You know, I, I, you know, I know that, you know, given that you're in Massachusetts and Connecticut, um, that that's different than, say, West Virginia, Louisiana and Wyoming or New Mexico. But I do think that sharing stories across lines, you know, I had the mayor of uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico on yesterday and they're doing all sorts of stuff in solar. I had the mayor of Phoenix on earlier doing stuff in solar. But I said, you know, a lot of our state budget is still tied to other sectors that also need to improve their game, you know, safety, efficiencies, et cetera. How do you, I mean, I'm kind of putting, you know, pressure, how does Massachusetts find common cause with, say, West Virginia in having a healthy discussion on some of this stuff? Mark? Well, let me just give you an example. The Council of State Governments, which I represent at right. the uh, regional and state level, just created a new uh, part of its organization uh, called the uh, Council of State Governments, United States 
uh, State Legislative Climate Alliance. Mm. These are legislators from throughout the entire United States that are working together to come up with solutions that are not just goals or uh, a press conference, but rather requirements mm. at the state level. One provision in the Massachusetts uh, legislation that just passed uh, within the last month uh, that requires net zero uh, by 2050 emissions reductions includes the natural world, uh, farming, mm. regenerative farming, uh, sequestration by planting trees, etc. We're having a conference on the 20, uh, 23rd and 24th of this month hmm. that will be open nationally. Uh, people in agricultural communities, rural communities, all across the country will be able to tune in and be involved and deal with this very issue. So there's commonality of purpose dealing with the natural and working lands which in our case is going to uh, be a big piece of what we need to do, uh, more than 15% of what our requirements will be. And these are requirements here in Massachusetts. And we can uh, do a lot with creating carbon sinks, uh, mm. actually sequester carbon uh, from, the, from the atmosphere and have that work uh, uh, in the best interests of our farmers uh, food to table uh, programs, hmm. uh, making sure we have employment in the farm community. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great uh, addition. In addition to that, we look at offshore wind uh, as, as uh, a secretary uh, mentioned a few minutes ago, offshore wind is a huge deal for us, not only in Massachusetts, but up and down the Eastern seaboard and uh, out west, uh, in the uh, on the Pacific uh, seaboard, uh, as as well, it will be huge with maybe floating turbines, uh, a lot of land-based wind. Uh, it's it's an area which uh, our first bid that went out for Vineyard Wind came in at six point five cents a kilowatt hour. Mm. Uh, it, it's amazing. And then the second bid that came in from Mayflower Wind will provide energy at a cost of 5.8 cents per kilowatt hour. And part of that partnership agreement with Mayflower Wind is Shell Energies. So it's yeah. the it's the fossil fuel industry getting into the clean energy industry, not being a fossil fuel company, but rather a clean energy company moving forward. I think it's very uh, interesting how you frame that. And Katie, I know you've, you've been doing wind, but I also know to my little cheat sheet here, you also believe in these integrated, you know, the importance of integrated plans. Um, and later in our show today, I'm interviewing the former CEO of General Electric, GE, Jeff Immelt. I uh, read his book called Hot Seed, but in it he talks about wind and he talks about renewables, he talks about that portfolio. And recently I spent some time with the current CEO of GE and I got a real lesson in the engineering of wind, which is a lot harder than people think. And the technology investment in it, in making it uh, greater scale and whatnot is an exciting new growth place within that company, which is, but they're also into gas and looking at hydrogen and other dimensions. You know, and I just sort of feel like every time I, you know, kind of rip a little bit more skin off this subject, I learned something else that I didn't know was it. What for you, I mean, I know wind is part of there, but what are some of the new, exciting, or even boring uh, next dimensions of the energy picture uh, that you see out there? Well, um, you know, the things that I lay awake at night <laughs> uh, getting excited about, but also worrying about is, what are we going to be reaching for? What what investments, what technologies um, are uh, we going to be able to deploy that are emission free and that will keep the um, power, keep the grid running when the wind isn't blowing, when the sun isn't shining? 
Um, you know, we have we know that battery storage costs have been coming down precipitously. Hmm. Um, that's really exciting. We're starting to take see that uh, take off. Um, energy efficiency investments, demand response. You mentioned hydrogen. Um, Connecticut is the home to a lot of fuel cell manufacturing, and so hydrogen fuel cells can be incredibly impactful if we can get that um, technology, you know, uh, out of the gate and uh, and really at, at commercial scale. So, um, you know, these are these are the the things that we really have to tackle to be able to squeeze out those those last bits of of carbon emissions uh, from our electric grid as we see more low cost renewables um, coming onto the system. And our job, you know, at the state level, and especially um, advocating for reforms to our energy markets um, uh, at FERC and, and um, is to ensure that there are clear uh, and consistent market signals for investors um, to invest in those technologies and 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 get them uh, developed across our region. That's going to be the next big puzzle to unlock. But we have some of the best engineers, some of the best companies, you know, in this country. And mm. uh, by again approaching that nonpartisan approach of tackling this issue, we're going to unlock so much investment potential and innovation. And I'm really excited about the role that states can play in facilitating that. That's, that's really cool. Uh, hey, Kathleen, I want to ask you what keeps you up at night, too, or what, you know, is delighting <laughs> you about the future. But I want to do it through a little twist in there. Um, a couple of years back, I interviewed Rick Perry, who was then Secretary of Energy, but he was also previously the governor of Texas. And he got on a tear and he kept talking about and bragging about the efficiencies uh, that they had achieved in emissions, that they had achieved in, you know, all sorts of oil and, you know, gas and energy efficiencies and how, uh, cars, you know, were driving further. I mean, he was very proud of this. And I kept saying, are you going to get in trouble with the White House for, you know, talking so much about all the efficiencies you, you, you achieved during uh, uh, your time in, in, as governor? And it was, it was a bit of a laugh. But I think part of the question is there are a lot of things that were being achieved, you know, in terms of efficiencies, in terms of improvements in safety, in terms of the broader arena of sustainability. So as you kind of, you know, with your role in the state of Massachusetts and whatnot, um, are you talking to these other sectors and what they can do to also be part of the track on climate and the track on broader sustainability? So in Massachusetts, to get to a fully decarbonized economy by 2050, all of our sectors need to be involved. And so we don't we don't tackle climate change as an environment or energy issue alone. It touches public transit. It touches cars and the progress being made um, not only on you know the carbon intensity of the vehicles that are being produced but also the drivability i think it's a mm. great example you know you, you take an ev out for a spin these days the horsepower on those things the maneuverability and the upkeep and maintenance requirements that go down make them not only good for the climate and the environment but also just great cars to own great cars to drive and uh you know we're seeing the variety increase in them but in terms of um, really a cross-sectoral approach to addressing something that's going to affect every aspect of our economy, every aspect of society, we need everyone playing a part in this transition and all of the learning that we can take from other sectors who have really um, you know, changed the game in whatever space they are playing in to help us figure out all of these clean energy solutions and the rapid decarbonization that we are going to be tackling. I mean, another thing that does keep me up at night and that is something uh, that we are thinking a lot about in Massachusetts in the same way in sort of a whole society sort of way is climate resiliency and making sure we're planning mm -hmm. for resilient infrastructure, investing in solutions that are not going to increase our risk to climate impacts, but are going to mitigate it and that you know any piece of infrastructure that we're touching uh, as a state government is being built not for current conditions but for the conditions of the future with climate change impacts so, so that is something that keeps me awake um, worrying about and, and making sure we incorporate it into our approach i think my my up at night issue is like watch all this you know we're all watching binge watching tv shows and you see some of these tv shows out there like you know oh what's the one i'm uh uh, uh, the one where all in Mars and space and they kind of show where all the water has gone and, you know, Massachusetts is barely there. Th those kinds of things keep me up, but lots of places. But look, we are taking uh, questions from our audience. We'd love that we've got a good one for you from Lindsay Powers. Lindsay? 
Hi, my name is Lindsay Powers, and I work for the U.S. Geological Survey. I'm the program coordinator for the National Geological and Geophysical Data Preservation Program. And my question for the panel is, how can federal-state partnerships better support smart and clean energy development? Thank you. Nice, simple question. Mark? Well, let me just give you an example of a bill that uh, has been filed for the upcoming session in Massachusetts. And we're filing the bill because we're looking at the federal partnership with the Biden administration. Hmm. Uh, the Biden administration coming in, uh, taking climate and clean energy and putting it at the center of everything that is taking place in all of government approach uh, with Gina McCarthy uh, leading the effort at the domestic side and John Kerry uh, internationally. It's an, an exciting time uh, for us. Can uh, I interrupt for a minute? Baker administration, the Baker administration had put together uh, some internal goals and we have uh, filed legislation to actually take some of the built environment, the existing infrastructure that is out there and making sure that we're going to make that totally, uh, to totally retrofit that built environment, the deep dive in energy efficiency, switching out oil and gas, uh, you know, burners, uh, utilizing heat pumps, uh, getting into as much as 50 to 70% savings hmm. in energy demand and cutting back in, in you know, on, uh, on uh, energy demand and making sure we have an energy efficient system. We have a goal of a million homes over 10 years, 100,000 a year to really go after this and cut back on the demand of energy in the first place. And we're looking to partner with our federal uh, side. So we have a federal state partnership hmm. targeting this very issue. The Secretary of Energy uh, was uh, uh, doing an interview yesterday with the Clinton Foundation talking hmm. about this very type of uh, strategy. We can do this if we work together. Senator, I was going to jump in and interrupt you and say I completely endorse your uh, view of Gina McCarthy. And I wanted to tell our audience that she was my last interview uh, last evening uh, in this program, and you should watch it. She is the president's national climate advisor, the first one that we've had, mm -hmm. former president of the Natural Resources Defense Council. It was extraordinary discussion, some of which touched uh, exactly on what Mark uh, Pacheco just said. So completely agree. Um, uh, Kathleen, I would love to, to get your response as well. And a, I will say, in a Massachusetts and Connecticut state official at various points in her career. So we're very Oh, good. Very oh, I didn't know that. Have, <laughs> yes. Yeah. We're very I, proud I, I to heard have the Gina slight accent, position. but I didn't want to presume. <laughs> yes. Yes. She was our DEP commissioner, our Department of Environmental Protection yes. um, up in Massachusetts. And I think a similar role down in, in Connecticut, Connecticut. Wow. As, as well. Uh, you know, I think there are any number of ways um, to partner with the feds on really uh, cleaning up the, the supply of energy resources that we use. And a key point uh, to this piece is looking at um, the full life cycle of anything that we're using, uh, whether it's offshore wind, biomass, um, any of the fuels that each point of the life cycle is, is part of the Hmm. Um, equation in terms we're, in terms of how we're looking at our energy supply. I think we are going to need um, significant investment as well from the federal government and something that we've really been looking for. Um, for example, the question of green and blue hydrogen and what kind of role it's going to play in the future. Um, is it just going to be limited to sort of heavy duty fleets and some of the really stubborn sectors for transitioning to clean fuels? Or is it going to be a much broader use in terms of our heating sector and other places. So these are some key areas where I think um, implementation is gonna happen a lot at the state level, but the investment and the research uh, and some of the, the sort of piloting that's needed of these programs is, is going to seek a significant federal, or is going to need a significant federal push forward. Thank you. Katie, I'm going to uh, give you the last word and respond to this question, but I want to give it a little bit of a twist. A lot of the folks, you know, I don't know if they're right or wrong, have told me that one of the inflection points in our energy profile is going to be gas, that, that there's just very hard to move 
you know, uh, uh, carbon intensity without greater gas, hydrogen, etc. And a lot of people that are very central that say we don't have the infrastructure in place for it. So um, I guess my question is, there's one thing to talk about something, but as you talk about coordination and these partnerships that are being needed, you know, the Biden uh, infrastructure bill coming down, you know, it, it, do, what do we need to begin thinking about to your knowledge in terms of retrofitting this country with a different set of infrastructure options in energy? Well, I think, that, again, that's where it comes back to, you know, resources like energy storage, like battery storage, mm. demand response, dispatchable hydropower. You know, these are the types of emission free alternatives to natural gas uh, power generation that will be able to help turn on quickly mm. um, and keep the grid reliable when the renewables aren't operating. You know, another um really, you know, exciting uh, technology application that we want are keeping our eyes on are around electric vehicle batteries. Mm. Um, so, you know, we, <laughs> we're we excited to be moving um, the Transportation Climate Initiative Program forward um, here in Connecticut. It's going to generate about a billion dollars of investment over a decade in clean transportation solutions, um, including just a few weeks ago, um, we talked about the first electric school bus uh, that we've purchased here in the state of Connecticut. We have 6,000 school buses in our state. Um, we could power them all with electricity uh, if, if we have this level of funding from TCI in place. But those school buses aren't running all the time and they have powerful batteries that could be plugged into the grid to uh, flow power back to store power and flow power back to the grid um, at, at peak times and, and when needed. And so there's a lot of really um, interesting interactions or, or opportunities to harmonize an electrified transportation fleet um, with our a power grid mm. that will, again, help to reduce our reliance on um, fossil fuels for uh, keeping the grid reliable when renewables aren't operating. So, you know, it's going to take a different kind of coordination than we're, when we're used to between sectors. But I think this is goes back to what um, Secretary of the Heritage said, which is this is not something we're doing in silos, you know, sector by sector. But again, we see we're looking mm. for all these kinds of synergies between transportation and, and, and the electricity sector and so on. I love that you're all um, wonks in this area. And so I'm just asked real quickly because I'm just interested, is America going to get its act together so we have a big enough package to go to Glasgow with? I asked this of Gina McCarthy. She was positive, wouldn't give me the number. She said she, she likes me, but wouldn't tell me um, what, what Biden was going to uh, unveil. But, you know, you know this world, you know these people. You know, Mark uh, uh, Pacheco said at the beginning, uh, we weren't doing enough previously. We have to do more now. So are you positive or are you concerned about Glasgow? Uh, Senator? America's back. We're mm. going to be uh, we're going to be out there not only talking about it, but doing it. All you have to do is take a look at the American jobs plan that President Biden has uh, has put out there and has challenged all of us to rise up, put our partisan labels aside and lead as Americans. We can do this. We can do it together and we can create millions and millions and millions of new jobs. Madam just Secretary. Just the two oh. projects I mentioned, just the two projects mm -hmm. I mentioned to you uh, before in Massachusetts is 83,000 new jobs by 2030 in those two offshore wind projects and the supply chain that go along with them. That's just two wow. out of you know, now, you know, Biden is talking about 30 gigawatts uh, by 20, 2030. And, and, and the list goes on. I mean, I think, yes, we can do it if we do it together. Hmm. And, uh, and America will, it is and will continue to lead on us. Terrific. Madam Secretary, positive, concerned. Very or positive. <laughs> I think it is great to see the federal government where, um, where the Biden administration is now. And really importantly, as I mentioned previously, for the last four years when climate change was not a focus at the federal level, the states like Connecticut, like Massachusetts stepped in. We set goals, but more importantly, every single day we woke up in the morning and drove programs and solutions and policies to meet and achieve those goals and show the rest of the world that climate action was continuing at the state level and when you take all of the states who have been working on this together with the targets we've set and the emission reductions we are hitting through our policies, 
we're not only tracking to deliver on the emission reductions we need to show the rest of the world real climate leadership, um, but in the process, we've developed hmm. technologies, solutions, and really strong um, policies and a ready and willing workforce to take on this challenge on the global stage. Cool. We got two positives. Madam Commissioner, where are you? <laughs> I'm really excited. I mean, listen, you know, leadership uh, it brings leverage. And I think I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to lean into this moment um, and that uh, and show that the U.S. is out front, that we can take on an ambitious target because we know at the state level, you know, Connecticut's a small state. Um, some folks might say, look, wh why do we need to have ambitious climate targets, you know, here in a state the size of Connecticut, we're not going to solve this problem alone. But when we put it, the programs in place, when we set the targets, other states come with us and the technologies, the market mm -hmm. responds. And so, you know, solar panels, offshore wind uh, turbines, batteries, electric vehicles, these are all technologies that we were counting on, uh, but that were expensive. We put the targets in place, the manufacturers responded, and now they're, they're becoming more and more affordable every day. So the innovation is there, the market will come, the manufacturing, the jobs are all poised to take off. All we have to do is set the ambitious targets and point the, the, the world to where we want to go, and it will happen. And I'm very, I, I we, we have such strong leadership in Washington now, um, and I, I'm just thrilled for how we're coming onto this stage um, as a leader on climate. Well, it's great to hear these stories. We'll leave it there. Commissioner Katie Dykes is uh, a commissioner of the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection for the state of Connecticut. State Senator Mark Pacheco is Commonwealth in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He's chair of the Energy and Environment Committee there. Uh, Secretary of Kathleen Theo. Theo Her Her I'm sorry, Theo Herides uh, is, is Secretary, Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs at the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It was a real pleasure talking to all of you. I hope we get more chances to do this. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you.